All right, back again. CYSA Plus. Ten weeks. Ten weeks. I know, you probably watched one of the two videos and I said the same thing. Uh, but it's ten weeks today. Ten weeks of doing practice exams. That's 50 questions that we've taken at the end of this one and done a deep dive on to identify the correct answers as we practice for our Security Plus certifications. As we practice to get through those certifications now as always we're going to start off a little bit easy and then work our way up to the higher level higher difficulty questions um not a lot has changed with cysa plus we're still doing total outputs we're still doing logging made it a little bit more difficult that's the goal let's uh let's see if we can't stump you let's see if we can't stump you on this one uh let's get right into it shall we all right, question number one. Which of the following is the primary purpose of a honeypot in a network environment? I think we've asked this question before. If not in CYSA, definitely in another Surrey Curie Plus or even Network Plus question. But that's okay. That's okay. Uh, starting off a little bit easy, as always. Get your brain fluids flowing. Get those juices pumped up for our security certification. Uh, what do you think? We're not going to spend a lot of time on this. Remember, 30 to 45 seconds. You have a little bit more time on CYSA than that. A little bit more time. But we definitely don't want to be going through uh, and spending too much time on it. So uh, without further ado, I feel like this one's a pretty easy one. If you need more time, go ahead and pause the video. We're going to go ahead and answer this one. Which of the following is the primary purpose of a honeypot in a network environment? Uh, let's start with D. To monitor network performance and optimize bandwidth. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. It's not going to be deep. Uh, honeypots have nothing to do with network performance and optimizing bandwidth. I think I think that was an easy one to scratch off our list. Uh, let's skip down to C. To encrypt sensitive data to prevent data breaches. Again, I don't think so. I don't think so, right? Uh, encryption of data to prevent security data breaches. I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, and that leaves A and B, right? A, to act as a firewall to block unauthorized access possibility or b to detect and analyze potential intrusions by attracting attackers i don't know if we know that a honeypot is all about attracting users then we know that a honeypot is going to be b to detect and analyze potential intrusions by attracting attackers that's where we do we, we attract the attackers we lure them in and then we can monitor them for ttps tactics techniques and procedures and we can see What's going on? We can see what's going on with that aspect of it. So B would be our correct answer. Uh, to act as a firewall to block unauthorized access? Eh, I don't know. Not at all. I mean, I said a possibility. The, the possibility would be wrong, but yeah, not, not really a possibility if you really think about it. B. B is going to be our correct answer. There we go. All right. Question number two, a little bit more difficult. A security analyst notices unusual outbound traffic from several internal systems to a foreign IP address. Ooh. After conducting a preliminary investigation, the suspect, I'm sorry, they suspect data exfiltration attempt. Which of the following would be the most effective immediate action to take? Effective immediate action. What do we want to do? What's our knee-jerk reaction associated with that? Again, we want to go through these, right? We have a little bit more time with CYSA than we did with Security Plus, right? But the questions are harder. They're more scenario-based. So we really want to make sure, really want to make sure in CYSA that we're reading the question. We're reading the possible answers. We reread the question. We want to know what is the question actually asking us. This is common, and you hear me like, I'm going to pound this in your brain. This is common with CompTIA, right? They are out to make you guess something else. That's their entire goal. Their entire goal. It's not to be nice to you. And in CYS day, we start to see a little bit more of that that we didn't see in Security Plus or Network Plus, right? Um, and so their their goal is to divert you. Their goal is to get you to click on the wrong thing. That's really what they're trying to do. All right? Okay. Uh, if you need more time, pause the video. Let's answer this one. A security analyst notices unusual outbound traffic from several internal systems to a foreign IP address. After conducting a preliminary investigation, they suspect a data exfiltration attempt. Which of the following would be the most effective immediate action to take? Obviously, we're going to shut down all affected systems for current data loss. Let's shut down the network said no CISO ever, ever, right? I think A is 100% not going to happen. Not going to happen. We get rid of A. Uh, let's skip down to C. Notify the legal team and begin drafting a public statement. We're not, we're not public relations. It's not us. We're cyber. That's us. We're cybersecurity analysts. Uh, why would we notify the legal team and begin drafting a public statement? We're not going to draft anything. That's up to them. 
We, we might tell them what's going on if we had to, but that's definitely not the immediate action. That's like a, have you ever seen those movies or those, uh, or those TV series where they're all about bureaucracy uh, and that's all they know? That is the ultimate form of bureaucracy. We are not bureaucrats. That is not our job. Our job is to save, guard information and data. We're the actual doers. That's what we do, right? Save the legal team and that for managers. That's their job and not us, right? That leaves B or D. Block the foreign IP address on the firewall, continue monitoring, or disable internet access for the entire organization to contain the breach. Obviously, we're going to disable internet access to the entire organization. That's what we're going to do. We're going to go through, we're going to plug the pull, pull the plug on the internet, disable everything, and we're going to knock down 10,000 machines. And when people call us and say they don't have internet, we're going to tell them, I'm sorry, we have a breach. Obviously, that is not what we're going to do. Not what we're going to do. We're just going to block the IP address on the firewall. We're going to block it. We're going to continue to monitor. We're going to see if it tries to attempt to a different IP address. Uh, and we're going to go from there. We're going to start investigation. But we're going to block that foreign IP address right off the gates. That's what we're going to do. Answer is going to be B. B is the proper answer right there. There we go. 100%. All right. Question number three. During a security assessment, an analyst identifies the server that is vulnerable to newly discovered zero-day exploit. The server hosts critical applications that cannot be taken offline immediately. Which of the following mitigation strategies should the analyst prioritize to protect the server from exploitation? A little bit more difficult on this one. What do you think? Give me some time on this one. Remember, read the question carefully. Carefully read the question. What are they asking us? What do they want from us? And then KISS. Keep it simple, stupid. I'm not saying you're stupid. I'm just saying let's keep it simple. All right? Keep it simple. Right? That KISS methodology. Remember, the simpler we keep our answers, the better. We're not out for complexity. That's not what Security Plus is all I'm sorry, CYSA Plus is about. That's not what it's about, right? We're not out there to make things too complex for us. Uh, if you're one of those people that overthinks the answer, I got bad news for you. Stop overthinking the answer. Stop overthinking the answer, okay? Uh, and if you're one of those people that's in IT, in cybersecurity, remember, dandelions, unicorns, and rainbows. That's what Security Plus and uh, CYSA is all about. It's a perfect world unless they tell you otherwise. And so stop thinking about what actually happens in your own organization and start thinking about the book scenario, the theoretical scenario, where everything else is dandelions, unicorns, and rainbows. Because that's how we need to answer this question, okay? All right, uh, if you need more time, pause the video. During a security assessment, an analyst identifies a server that is vulnerable to a newly discovered zero-bit exploit. The server hosts critical applications that cannot be taken offline immediately. Which of the following mitigation strategies should the analyst prioritize to protect the server from exploitation? Uh, we can apply the latest patches and updates as soon as they are available. Yeah, that's what we're going to do. We're just going to sit there and wait while we have a zero-day exploit. That's, you know, waiting is a mitigation strategy. It really, I mean, it's not a good mitigation strategy, but I guess it would be considered a mitigation strategy. Um, yeah, I don't think so. I don't think so. Not going to happen. Uh, B, reconfigure the firewall to block all incoming traffic to the server. So we just said that we can't take off offline, but we're going to take off part of it, right? So we're not going to take the entire thing offline. We're just going to take down half the internet. You know, the half that gives us data. That's the half. No, no. B is wrong. B is wrong. That leaves us C, implement a virtual patch by applying IPS signatures that detect the exploit. Or D, increase the server's logging level to capture more detailed event information. Which one of these is a preventive measure and which one is a detective measure? I think you know the answer. I think based off of that hint, you know the answer. You know it's C. We're going to implement a virtual patch by applying IPS signatures that detect the exploit. And what we're saying is we've already identified the exploit. We've identified it. Uh, even though it was zero day. Now that we've identified it, let's grab that signature. Let's plug that signature into our IPS and let's let our IPS do its job. Right? And so that's what we're going to do. The answer is going to be C. Implement a virtual patch. That's what we're going to do, all right? Uh, question number four. Well, I should say question number three. There's the answer. Question number four. A little bit more difficult on this one. A little bit more difficult on this one. Let me scooch over a little bit. I tried my really hardest to get this one right. Apparently, apparently I did not. Let me, my face is still in the way. I was doing better this time, but I, I guess I didn't, I didn't do it successfully. Uh, a security analyst is investigating potential compromise of a web server. They check the output of netstat command and review the HTTP access logs. The following observes. We have two logs here. We have a netstat and we have an HTTP. Based on the netstat output and the HTTP access logs, what actions should the analyst take next? Now, this is this is a downright dirty question. It is. You've got two sets of logs. You need to compare them. You need to contrast. You need to identify and critically think what's going on 
with these logs and what should we do next? What do you think? I'm going to give you some time on this one. I really am. Okay. I'm not going to give you all the time in the world, though. I am going to make you kind of go through. All right. Um, there's a variety of different ways or strategies you can utilize to look at this log. Uh, and, and this is the strategy. I'm going to show you how I would do this one. Uh, because we can be looking at these logs for a long time. And a lot of times the answers will give us hints. It will give us hints as to what we need to do, right? Uh, and that's how I like to approach this. So if you need more time, if you need more time, go ahead and pause the video. Let's let's dissect this one. Let's get into this one, okay? Uh, this is the tactic that I would utilize to answer the question, okay? All right, so right off the bat, right? Uh, let's start with D. Review the configuration of the server to determine why it is accepting connections on port 22. Uh, I don't feel like that's an appropriate answer, right? There's various reasons. We know, just by reading this, we know that port 22 is SSH, right? So if we review the configuration of the server to determine why it's accepting connections for port 22, we can start looking at port 22 here. And we see on the netstat log, we see that we had something connect to port 22 right here, right? Right here. And it's connecting to a foreign IP address, which is... 100.8 and we see that but we also see an attached on 443 right and if we go over to our https we can see dot eight right there came in and we can see the time frame and we see script set up all this other good stuff so i don't feel like reviewing the configuration of the server to determine why it's accepting connections on port 22 is a valid answer to be honest it doesn't as that stage is common it, it it really is especially for a server and so D doesn't make sense to me, um, especially since there was nothing on the HTTP log or the SSH log that really kind of pointed in that direction, all right? Uh, C, block IP address from 203.0.113.5 on the firewall due to multiple failed login attempts. All right, so let's find this, 203.0.113.5. Uh, and we see this, right? We see on the net stat, we see 203.113, and we see... Uh, it connected on port 80 for HTTPS, or excuse me, HTTP, not HTTPS, HTTP. And we see that it's uh, on there, right? And if we go over to 113.5, we can see login, PHP, post login, and then admin dashboard. Um, and that's it. But this one says, due to multiple failed login attempts, and I'm not seeing failed login attempts. I'm seeing a login that took place. That's not a failed login attempt. And so C, automatically discounted, okay? Uh, then we have B, uh, terminate the, uh, the established SSH session from IP address 198.51.100.8 to prevent further damage. Um, again, I, I'm looking at D and I'm like, we want to review it, now we want to terminate it. But again, it's giving us HTTP logs for a reason, right? And I think that's a hint. It's, it's telling me, look at this net stat logs and then look at the http logs and see what's going on between the two and again i think i think that that's a big hint in there why are we looking at 22 why why is there's nothing in here for 22 at all on the http logs and there wouldn't be because it doesn't establish but then we have 22 on here again i feel like that's a, a, a misnomer uh which leaves us only with a investigate the ip address at 198.51.100.8 for potentially unauthorized access to sensitive files and with that, it kind of makes sense. And, and this is where I'm coming from, right? If we look at 198.51.100.8, we see it on HTTP. And we see here that we get, right? Then it ran a script. And we see that setup.sh right there. And it ran some type of script. And this, this concerns me. This, this script setup.sh, right? That concerns me a little bit. And then we get admin login PHP. And so if we look above, we see typical login access. But on this one, we don't. We see that they ran a script, and then they uh, went to the login page. And then we have SSH over here. Now, this one was all in um, port 80, right? And we see port 80, we see port 80, we see 443, and we see port 22. And then we see that port is over here, 203. This is the foreign IP address outside our network. We see the IP address, and then the ports associated with it and so on and so forth right these are specifically to 100-8 right here where it went to 443 and 22. um and so this one is the only one that really makes sense for me where we investigate the ip address 
for potential unauthorized access to sensitive files. Uh, and that's because when you combine this script right here with SSH between the two, it appears that they may have gained access to SSH off-site, right? And they shouldn't have. And that that's where the concern comes into play, okay? Uh, the other one, the 203, that doesn't really make sense. Uh, the configuration for the server to determine why it's accepting connections, that done doesn't make sense. Uh, terminating uh, an established session, that's not going to stop anything. It doesn't prevent anything, right? If I terminate a, a session, they're just going to log back in, right? All we're doing is, is, is terminating. It doesn't say to turn it off. It doesn't say to do anything else. And so if we look at it from all the possible answers, the only one that really makes sense is A, is A, right there. Okay. Now I lean back and, and I just noticed my, my t-shirt. I have to thank my, my in-laws for this. When I graduated with my doctorate degree, they get me a president and it, and it, there you go. it says it right there. Cause I knew somebody was going to ask, right? Uh, I have a doctorate to save time. Let's just assume I'm always right. Uh, my, my in-laws got that for me for my graduation gift for my PhD, um, a while ago. I, I hardly ever wear it, but it was sitting on the top of my drawers today. And I was like, you know what? Why not? Why not? So, uh, I know some people love to want read the T-shirts, but that's why. All right, I hope I hope question four makes sense. It's going to be A. A is going to be our correct answer on that one. There we go. A. All right. Question number five. I know we got a big one here. I'm gonna actually I'm gonna turn off my view so you don't even have to see my face. Let's get rid of that. There we go. All right. Uh, a cybersecurity analyst receives an alert about a potential malware infection on a critical server. The analyst reviews the following logs. Which of the following actions should the analyst prioritize to investigate potential malware infection, right? What do you think? A uh, lot of information here, a lot of information. Uh, I took my picture out because there was so much data in this one. I want you to look this over. I want you to spend some time. This would be typical of a, uh, a very detailed question, uh, one that I would anticipate spending a couple minutes on, a couple minutes on. And that's why we want to do those easy questions. We only want to spend no more than a minute on the easy ones. We don't want to spend a lot of time. Remember, time management is one of those things that you want to utilize on your CYSA plus exam. It really does. All right. So let's let's dissect this question because it really needs to go through. I'm not telling you to pause yet. You got you got time. Don't worry. I'm going to tell you to pause uh, because I'm not going to wait. But but you kind of go through there. All right. And I feel like I feel like the best way to do this one, honestly, is the same way we did the last one. It really is. Because they provide us so much information here um, that we could look at it for a while before the light bulb rings off. And so this strategy for answering these types of questions really comes into play if we just read the answers and we go through it. And we can we can get them off. We can knock off the appropriate answers as we see fit. All right, let's let's go ahead and pause the video. Let's go ahead and knock this one out, right? All right, so which which of the following actions should the analyst prioritize to investigate potential malware infection? Uh, we can see here that we got event ID number one. We see rule name is non-existent. We see the time. We see image. It's pulling up a CVS host image. We see the command line. We see the uh, percent image. Uh, I'm sorry, the parent image. I don't know why it's the percent. And then we see the parent command line. And we see this throughout the entire log, right? And we have logs one, th excuse me, events one, three, 10, and 11. All right, so it says terminate the process stbhost.exe as it's executing suspicious commands. Um, I would look at this and I would go, okay, uh, is this executing a malicious command? And I'm not, as I go through this, right, I'm not seeing anything that suggests that, uh, that the service host is executing suspicious commands. There's nothing on here that makes me go, that's what it's doing, all right? Um, and so it, it doesn't really look like that would be an issue. It really doesn't. Here's the here's the problem with this, right? If we look even down here at event number 11, right? We see the image, and I feel like this is the one right here that this is really targeting, okay, for A. It gives us the image. It gives us the image of the SV host, right? But then it says the target file is under users, public downloads, malicious DLL. Uh, and I think that this is trying to get you to terminate the SV host, the service host, right? However... However, uh, if we terminate that process, right, while we may stop, while we may stop any malicious activity from occurring, uh, we could also, unfortunately, eliminate some evidence, right? Uh, further, further, that SCV host, it's actually a Windows process. It's a legitimate Windows process. 
And so by terminating it, we could actually disrupt functions on the server. Uh, and it really wouldn't, it wouldn't help us. It really, really wouldn't help us. It might stop the malware, but as soon as we boot up the system again, we've got some other issues. Um, and so A just doesn't really make sense. There's not a lot right with, with A. All right, let's, let's move down to B. Um, perform a full disk scan to detect, remove any additional malware files, right? Um, a full disk scan is time consuming, right? It's, it's very thorough, but it's, it's very time consuming. Uh, and it could potentially find additional malware files. And it's definitely something we would want to do, but we would want to do it after containment. We want to do it after we isolate it, after we segment off the network. It's not something we want to do uh, when we're in the investigation stage. That's not, that's not something we want to utilize, right? And so I don't feel like performing a full disk scan to detect or remove any additional malware at this point in time makes a lot of sense. It really doesn't. It's definitely something we would want to do, just not at this stage, not at the stage of identifying it, right? Not, not at the uh, uh, investigation stage, right? Okay, that leaves us C and D, right? Isolate the server from the network to prevent further communication with the external IP address or delete the file, right? Uh, if we delete the file, we could in fact remove the malware. We could 100% do that, right? Uh, but we could also destroy evidence, uh, and it wouldn't allow us to understand the attack. If we just go off and we start deleting malware uh, willy-nilly, yes, we're, we're stopping malware, but what, what allowed it to come into our network? What allowed it to, to propagate on that server? Where, what was the root cause? What, what does it accomplish, right? Uh, and so we want to investigate it, and deleting it is going to stop that. There, and, and there's more than that, too, right? The system is still connected to our network. Uh, and it could regenerate. It could. It could be a, a worm. It could be a a um, uh, 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 any number of different malwares on there, right? It, it, I mean, I identify malware as, as or worm as a probable advocate, but it could also be a a logic bomb, right? It could be any number of things. And so, simply deleting it isn't going to have the effect that we want for immediate cause. It's not going to solve the long term issue. Uh, and the only one here that really makes sense. The only one that really makes sense on this one is isolating the server from the network to prevent further communication with external IP addresses. Why? Why? Because by isolating it, we're stopping it from communicating. We're stopping the exfiltration of data. We're, we're, let, we're not letting it receive any further instructions. We're saying, you know what, you can't talk to your boss, right? Um, and stopping it stops its spread, it prevents further damage. By allowing it, not allowing it to communicate with with a server or to a command control, by not allowing it to to exfiltrate data, we're stopping a lot of things, right? We've already identified that there's malware in the system. We already see that, and so I feel like this question, uh, in one part, is like, oh, we want you to concentrate on the investigation priorities, right? We want you to to investigate, but we've already kind of found that the logs already identified that there was malicious files on there. Right, and so we really want to isolate at this point. That's our next goal, right? Because remember, we want to prioritize containment over everything else. We want to contain what's going on, there, right? So we have we have our, and this is where those seven steps come into play. So if we remember our incident response process, right? Remember that it's prepare, right? We're already past the preparation phase. We have an actual incident. We want to identify. We've identified that we have malware. That's what we've identified it in the logs, the log show, right? We want to contain it. And that's where the isolation comes into play. That's the third step, isolate, containment, right? Once we contain, we want to eradicate. <coughs> Maybe that's when we do uh, the full disk scan to detect and remove, right? That would be eradication. Then we want to recover, put the system back in its original working state. And then we have a lessons learned phase. And finally, reporting and documentation, right? That's where it comes into play. All right. So we've already identified, now we isolate. And so C, C would be the correct answer on this one. There it is. All right, that's it for tonight. I hope you learned something. We'll have a good one, everyone.